The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anuj Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. On today's show, I have Dr. Peter Greenspoon. Peter is a renowned physician and educator specializing in cannabis, as well as having a number of other roles. Peter, welcome. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. No, real pleasure. Where in the world are you? I am in Boston, Massachusetts. Ah, cool. And how is how are things kind of developing there? in a post-COVID world? Can we call it yet that yet? Well, I wouldn't call it a post-COVID world. If it weren't for the Delta strain, Delta variant, it would be a post-COVID world. But it looks like things are going to starting to get a little... We're taking a step backwards right now. Really? Okay, yeah. No, I think it's similar everywhere, which is highly frustrating. But let's talk about the other C word, cannabis. You've got a great background here. I'm really excited. I'm a keen follower of yours on LinkedIn, so I'm really pleased I could get you on the show. We're going to actually talk about the war on drugs as the sort of main topic of the show, but as is traditional, let's start with a bit about you, if you don't mind introducing yourself and telling us a bit about what you do and what you what you were doing before and why you chose to sort of specialize in cannabis. Well, I'm a general doctor, a primary care physician in Boston. I take care of sort of an impoverished patient community. Um, I also have a private practice in medical cannabis, so I do medical cannabis sort of in both jobs. I teach medicine at also cannabis at Harvard Medical School. I work at Mass General Hospital. I've been involved in the cannabis issue literally my entire life for two reasons. The first reason is that my father was a pretty renowned cannabis advocate and specialist. His name was Dr. Lester Grinspoon, and he wrote a book in 1971 called Marijuana Reconsidered, calling for the legalization of cannabis at a time when the, only 12% of Americans supported legalizing cannabis. It was a very brave book. It was very well received. It was reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review. It was not well received by Richard Nixon. I have a picture of one of Nixon's daily briefings where he circled my dad's name and said, this clown is far to the left. He really didn't like my dad calling for legalization. But my dad's main concern was that criminalizing young people was much worse for them than having them actually use cannabis. You know, there are harms associated with cannabis, but the harms of criminalizing people was much worse. And my dad worked on this issue for the next 50 years, which meant that as I was growing up, there were always people in my living room debating legalization, how to legalize, debating the pros and cons of medical and recreational cannabis. So that's number one. And number two, my brother Danny, my older brother, fought an unsuccessful battle with leukemia. And my parents illegally in the 1970s got him medical cannabis to use. And it was literally the only thing that helped him hold down food during the last year that he was on chemotherapy. And it helped him live and then ultimately die with more comfort and dignity. So I saw firsthand at an early age how effective medical cannabis can be. And that really made me sort of immune to all of the nonsense they teach doctors about cannabis in medical school. I started my medical career with like very much an advocate of medical cannabis as opposed to, you know, just being sort of vulnerable to all the nonsense they give you. So I've been interested in it and involved in it my whole career. I've been treating patients with it starting about five minutes into medical school. I mean, not really, but basically. And, you know, I've been involved in several legalization campaigns. I'm a board member of an advocacy group called Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. We're trying to legalize and it in the rest of the United States, you know, in parts of the United States, you can sell cannabis and make a million dollars. And in other parts, you could sell cannabis and go to prison for 10 years, particularly if you're brown or black skin. So we're trying to rectify that. We urgently need to rectify that. And also, um, I just do a lot of writing and teaching and educating around cannabis. So that's sort of my involvement in a nutshell. I could literally go on for hours about it, but that's like the executive summary. That was a beautifully succinct executive summary. Thank you, Peter. There's so much there I'd like to delve into just before we kind of get onto the bigger topic. So you kind of had, you know, this influence from a very young age because of your father. And we'll, we'll ask you a bit about your dad in a minute. So when you entered medical school, were you kind of almost like having a dual track 
medical education because I assume that the conventional medical education you're receiving didn't talk about cannabis or the endocannabinoid system or any of that stuff at all. So were you kind of learning about that on your own? Absolutely. And, you know, they, they mentioned it sort of in a cursory manner in medical school, but it was usually, you know, sort of a warmed over drug war propaganda. It was just like cannabis, drug, addictive, a motivational syndrome, all that stuff. And, you know, I grew up with like, you know, these really brilliant luminaries in my living room in a cloud of marijuana smoke, you know, like Carl Sagan, people like that smoking. And I was like, you know, like this is a motivational. I'd hate to see what motivational is. Seriously, these people are writing like best-selling books. And, you know, and it wasn't just in medical school, like growing up, there was like cognitive dissonance because we had this like drug education where they're like cannabis makes you dumb. And then all these people in my home were like the most brilliant people you'd ever meet having these like spectacularly inspiring conversations. And it really inspired me to read and to study and to learn. And there was just such a dissonance between like what society was telling me about cannabis and what I was literally seeing with my own eyes, not just medically, but like sort of as a intellectual and social lubricant as well. So it was not just in medical school, but in general, in my whole life, it was just really this dichotomy. But yeah, in medical school, I was learning about it. And I remember in residency giving a presentation, my senior presentation on medical cannabis. And my colleagues were very, you know, the younger do that doctors are, the more accepting they are of medical cannabis because they're more open-minded and they spent less of their life, you know, subject to the sort of war and drugs propaganda. But they thought I was eccentric. You know, they all really liked me, but they're like, oh, here's Peter talking about medical cannabis again. And now 20 years later, they're like referring patients to me. And it's really, really cool. It's legal. It's more accepted. And we discuss cases. And it's just been really fun and interesting to watch societal perceptions swing in favor of medical and adult use cannabis as well. Yeah, and that's really nice to have that kind of arc, I suppose, of, you know, people being suspicious or, or maybe just generally ignorant, and now they're kind of starting coming around. One of the other things that you mentioned was that you teach at Harvard, and and that, for me, that sounds like quite amazing. And are you quite surprised by that, that you're, you know, teaching about cannabis in such a kind of austere kind of institution? Well, yes and no. I did grand rounds in my department about on medical marijuana, and I think it was probably one of the first, if not the first, like event at Harvard Medical that was not like anti cannabis, and people were very receptive to it. It was you know standing room only, but you know in other things I'm not like particularly welcome because you know a lot of the psychiatrists are still against it, and there's still a lot of stigma and sort of be a little bit diplomatic what I say, but you know, not all of the faculty at Harvard are as accepting of cannabis as I am. There's a real sort of dichotomy in the thought there. So in some venues, I'm like, you know, really appreciated and in others, I think I'm not quite as accepted because of my views are viewed as, you know, very on the progressive side about cannabis. So it's not like Harvard is, in some ways, it's very cutting edge and open-minded and accepting new ideas. And in other ways, it's sort of stodgy and conservative. So, you know, I get sort of, I see sort of both when I advocate for cannabis. Yeah, still some work to do. But, you know, really positive that you have a platform there. And, you know, some of the best brains are kind of listening to you. So that's great. And yeah, I just be remiss to not talk a bit about your dad a bit more, you know, that must have been crazy and such a brave thing to do, at, you know, at such a pivotal time, I suppose, when Nixon was still around and he was a pretty vindictive person. So to take him on is quite, you know, quite something. Yeah, I don't think he took him on as much as he took on the issue. And then Nixon sort of like just hated the fact that my dad proved that he was lying about the issue, like from beginning to end. My dad actually started out trying to prove that, you know, what are all these young people doing? You know, they're using this drug that's dangerous. Uh, he was sort of not in favor of it at all when he first started researching it. And then he did like this super deep dive and found out that a lot of the research was sort of intended to find harm. And that, you know, when you really look deep, there are harms like any medication that we prescribe, but that a lot of them had been really exaggerated and contrived. You know, he still shared concerns about the effect in the adolescent brain and he shared some concerns about, you know, use during pregnancy. It hasn't been proven to be safe. It's very hard to prove that. So he wasn't, you know, saying that it was harmless. But what he was saying is that it should be legal and, and that it has a lot of benefits, medical and in terms of like lifestyle enhancement, wellness. 
And so what was really amazing to me is his sort of intellectual integrity, the fact that he was able to be open-minded about this, because there was so much pressure from, you know, society, you know, the 87% that were in favor of keeping it illegal, just because that's what they've been taught from the medical school, from the medical establishment, all the other psychiatrists to come out with a book against cannabis like everybody else was. And he really did what he thought was right. He followed what he learned and, you know, was sort of a free thinker. And I just really admire that. I mean, he thought for himself and how many people truly are able to think for themselves and be such pioneers. He was so prescient too. It wasn't just cannabis. He's very famous for his work on cannabis, but in 1979, he wrote a book called Psychedelic Drugs Reconsidered, which was calling for the legalization or at least the decriminalization of psychedelics and for them to move out of the street and into the lab because he thought he made a case that they had a very, very important role in psychiatry to help with all kinds of issues like PTSD, addiction, depression. I mean, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's what's happening today. But he was calling for that in 1979 in a book that he wrote. I mean, he was so prescient. He was like 40 years ahead of his time, not just in cannabis, but in a whole variety. He also called for reducing the sentencing for like not putting people in prison for cocaine like decades ago. And now everybody else is calling for that. So I just thought he was really ahead of his time and had a lot of intellectual integrity. And, you know, I really, it was a great role model. I really just admired him so much. Yeah, I'm sure. Fantastic pioneer. And we're all grateful for the work that he did. Are you kind of surprised by how things have changed in the last sort of few years or or in a way, are you disappointed that it took so long? I mean, there's still a lot of work to do, but how do you reflect upon that? Well, I'm pleasantly surprised that it's changing in the way that it is. I mean, you know, things move slowly and it's been really interesting to me. What's been really interesting to me is how much more quickly the psychedelics have changed than the cannabis. You know, like, for example, the psychiatrists are still digging their feet in against cannabis, even though you know, like millions of people are using it. Like we know the harm. The government spent like $10 billion trying to prove the harm. It's been used by humans for 5,000 years. We basically know the harms. And still the psychiatrists sort of resist cannabis, even though, for example, the veterans are all saying it helps us with PTSD. It's like, let the veterans use it for PTSD. Why on earth would we not let the veterans use it for PTSD if they say it works? Why would they lie about it? helping them for PTSD. It doesn't make any sense. But then with psychedelics, you know, the psychiatrists are like, sure, let's give everybody mushrooms. What's wrong with having a schedule one substance that hasn't been tested? You know, it's just, it's so funny, the dichotomy between the rapid acceptance of psychedelics and the slow acceptance of cannabis. You know, I just wonder if, you know, cannabis sort of paved the way or if it's because there's just been less propaganda targeted against psychedelics or if it's because you could pharmaceuticalize them or, you know, it's really interesting. So, I mean, I know it's a little off topic of what you no. asked. This is really fascinating how the difference. It's very fascinating. A really good question. I think a slightly more effective PR campaign, I guess, against cannabis, which has been really deeply entrenched in many people, I suppose. And that takes a lot of unpicking and, and yeah, maybe psychedelics are more suited to a, a pharmaceutical pathway to to kind of licensing i don't know <laughs> right, we've been fighting with the psychiatry for the last 30 years they're like cannabis is a schedule one substance and now they're like oh psilocybin schedule one substance no problem it's just so funny to see it, it play out so it is strange i just sort of mystified. yeah yeah and then before we get into the main topic just you know you're practicing in this area and in your practice are you seeing an increase in people coming to you for cannabis and equally on the flip side are you suggesting cannabis as a treatment or medication to patients that perhaps have had no interaction with it before? Yes. What's interesting is a lot of elderly people are coming. Some people come and they say, I've been using it. I just want some advice how to like fine tune for particular medical problems. And other people come and that have never used it before. And, you know, they obviously take a lot more counseling because, you know, it's easier to, to counsel people who have used it, know how to use it, know what the effects are. But the most rapid adopters in the United States are people, baby boomers and elderly people. Really, the rates have been like doubling, which, and it's just really fascinating. It's a little bit sad because you have to work through some stigma. They sort of 
come into the office, make sure the shades are drawn. They whisper, can I try some medical cannabis? And it's like, sometimes they act like a SWAT team is going to barge through the window. And it's like, look, it's legal. It's legal in Massachusetts. It's no one's going to harm you. And, you know, you just have to be very careful and make sure that they, you know, start low and go slow and you educate them very carefully about the risks. Because the last thing you want is, you know, they hear from their friends, it works, it relaxes them, it makes their pain go away, and they get very enthusiastic. And you don't want them to overzealously go into a dispensary and say, oh, this brownie looks delicious, and then take a 100 milligram brownie and like freak out or go into a cardiac arrhythmia or something. So it's just a lot of education and encouraging people to be very patient. And, you know, if they're going to make a mistake about the dose, make the mistake they don't take enough, try again the next day, just a lot of the mischief you get into is if you take too big a dose. So a lot of it's like counseling people to like hold their horses, be patient. But yeah, a lot of people that have never tried it before, absolutely, because a lot of elderly people that are just new to it. And, you know, so many people are just destroying their kidneys by taking non-steroidal medications. You know, your ibuprofen, your naproxen, uh, day after day, year after year for this chronic pain that so many millions of people have as people get older, a little heavier, a little rounder, their knees hurt, their backs hurt. And, you know, they just chomp down the over-the-counter non-steroidals. And I think if we could switch people to like low-dose cannabinoids, we could protect so many people's kidneys, not to mention that the non-steroidals can give you an ulcer, bump you off with a heart attack as well. So I just think that we're going to see so many more people using cannabinoids for chronic pain. I think they're much safer for insomnia than a lot of the hypnotics. And then finally, recreationally, my, my theory, I don't think alcohol is a very interesting drug. You know, I'm happy to have a beer now and then, but I think that most people need something. You know, in a perfect world, we'd all have our yoga mat, our tofu, you know, we'd all meditate and, you know, talk to friends whenever we had a problem. But in reality, we're, none of us are perfect and most of us need something. And I think people use alcohol because that's the only thing that's been available because they've criminalized all the alternatives. I mean, again, a big part of the war on drugs was competing commercial interests. We'll talk about this, but it was never based on health or wellness ever. You know, the American Medical Association was a very strong voice against criminalizing cannabis in 1937 when they originally criminalized it. And I think now that people are going to have an alternative to alcohol, they're going to be like, hey, not only is cannabis safer, but it's a lot more fun and interesting than alcohol. So I just think we're going to have a lot more people using cannabis now that it's an option because alcohol is not going to be the only alternative anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I've certainly noticed it during the pandemic that one of the most common sort of commonly said things to me was I have a beer or a glass of wine at 5 p.m. because it takes the edge off. And, you know, if that's not kind of mental health or wellness situation, I don't know what is, you know, I think that's people have been using alcohol to do that to relax and rather than it just being a recreational thing. And maybe there's scope for that to change with something like cannabis. I think so. I mean, you know, a lot of the addiction specialists have never used or tried cannabis. And, you know, I make no secret of in my past life, I've smoked acres upon acres of cannabis. And I'm like really familiar with the effects. And like to take the edge off with a drink, it just makes you kind of sleepy and, you know, dull. And cannabis makes you like awake and heightens your perceptions and makes you want to connect with people and do things. It's like, I don't know, I'm not, as a doctor, I'm not allowed to like advocate for any drug use or anything, but I just think if like harm reduction wise, I'm allowed to advocate for harm reduction. If you had to pick between like a little bit of cannabis versus a little bit of alcohol, I just think the cannabis is so much better for people on a whole variety of levels. Sure. Absolutely. Cool. Well, so look, let's move on to the main topic, the war on drugs. Obviously it was popularized in the sixties by Nixon and probably, you know, exported to the rest of the world at that point, but obviously the seeds were sown at a much earlier stage. So would you mind just giving us a bit of a brief history of that before, and then we could talk about Nixon? Sure. Yeah. I mean, cannabis was legal in the United States in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It was a popular medicine. It came in little bottles of tincture. Some of the major pharmaceutical companies that are still around today packaged and distributed it. Again, as I said earlier, the American Medical Association vociferously argued against criminalizing it. And it was really criminalized for two reasons. Racism, you know, it was associated with Mexicans coming over the border. 
and African-American musicians a little bit later on. And it was competing commercial interests as time went on, you know, the paper industry, the pharmaceutical industry. And, you know, it's just really interesting because the doctors were originally against criminalizing it, but then they were put under a lot of pressure by the head of the narcotics division, uh, Harry Anslinger, this really racist guy who spearheaded the criminalization of cannabis. A lot of people think that he needed to do so because they had this huge law enforcement apparatus to enforce alcohol prohibition that had just been overturned. And like, what are these like thousands of prohibition agents going to do? They needed another thing to prohibit. And that's why there was a lot of pressure to criminalize something else. And then they criminalized cannabis. But You know, it's been really interesting trying to re-legalize cannabis in the United States. You look at who's been contributing to the efforts against legalizing cannabis, and it's been the rehab industry. They make a ton of money on these, like, court referrals. People, you know, kids get in trouble, get caught with cannabis, and they say to the parents, do you want your kid to go to juvenile detention or to rehab? And the parents are like, oh, rehab. So they call it cannabis addiction. I mean, the rehab industry makes a bundle. Law enforcement makes a killing on cannabis. They're allowed to seize assets if they suspect someone of drug dealing. And cannabis is such a soft thing for them to be doing. They they are so against legalization. The private prison industry in the United States, it's insane that we have a private prison industry at all. And they contribute tons against legalization. Uh, The pharmaceutical industry, because they want now they're giving up because that horse is out of the barn. But what they wanted was, and I think it's true in England too, they wanted to have like prescription cannabinoids that you had to buy, but not have it so that people can grow their own or have legal cannabis so they could make a killing on that. And then the alcohol industry, for the reasons we talked about, like they didn't want people to use cannabis because when you legalize cannabis, the alcohol sales go down. So the competing commercial interest was a huge part of it all along. It was just slightly different interests as time went on. Then in the early 1970s, Richard Nixon really ginned up a lot of opposition to all drugs and declared the war on drugs. And in addition to competing commercial interests and the usual racism, which unfortunately never seems to go away in the United States, it just seems to like, you know, wax and wane how public people are about it. And with Donald Trump, obviously people got a lot more, a lot less inhibited about expressing it. Then it was also a political component. I mean, Nixon, Nixon's chief of staff, Ehrlichman, admitted that they were using cannabis arrests to go after the black leaders of the Black Panthers and the leaders of the Vietnam War movement. I mean, it was just blatant political harassment. So then you have racism, competing commercial interests, and political opportunism. So again, health and health concerns were never part of making it or keeping it illegal. Now they're using these arguments. These corporate entities are funding ads during each legalization initiative to make health and wellness arguments against legalizing it. But legalization has been such a success so far. I mean, the teen rates of use haven't been going up. The traffic accidents haven't been going up. The use has been going up among adults, but a lot of the opiate use has been going down. Some of the alcohol use has been going down. It's been sort of a wash And again, if you also factor in how many fewer people are getting involved in the criminal justice system. I mean, in the year 2019, 500,000 people were arrested for cannabis possession. And think of what that does to people's health. That affects their student loans, their education, their housing, their employment. It causes like generational poverty. And, you know, in our country, blacks and whites use cannabis at the same rate, but blacks get arrested 3.7% times as often. I mean, it's absolutely horrible. So, I mean, legalization is spectacularly good for people's health if you look at the big picture. And you also factor in that, like, people use it for wellness and all kinds of other prescription drug use goes down. So anyways, that was sort of a long and rambling answer to your question (laughs) of the the war on drugs. But it was started in 1937 by Harry Anslinger, who ginned up a lot of racism about like black people getting white, black men getting white women high and taking advantage of them. Then there was a lot of pressure on the medical community, which very cowardly switched sides and became anti-cannabis. And then Richard Nixon accelerated it in the early 1970s. And then 
Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan had a field day and all these corporations pitched in and there were these ads, this is your brain on drugs, very stigmatizing, did awful stuff, made it so that anybody with an addiction got stigmatized and that directly contributed to our opiate overdose crisis. People have trouble getting help because they stigmatized anybody who uses drugs as like a bad person, not as someone who has a medical disease. And finally, people are realizing that with the war on drugs, and particularly with the war on cannabis, they've been sold a bill, this has been sold a, a bunch of nonsense. And people are realizing that you just have to think for yourself. And a lot of what the government has promulgated about cannabis is just like, flat out not true. And a lot of the research has been just like intended to find harm, not does this cause benefit or harm, but let's show that this causes harm. So you have to sort of reevaluate the research from scratch. So we're at a very interesting and exciting time. We're like, you know, coming back to where we were about 80 years ago and we're using it as a medicine. We're starting to rediscover the wellness attributes and we're also paying attention to the harms, but not with a monomaniacal focus on the harms, but with a more judicious kind of look at what are the benefits and what are the harms and how could we best use this in a helpful way. Yeah, absolutely. It's loads of stuff there. I mean, to go back to Nixon, you know, on a domestic front, it was a kind of useful tool to be able to criminalize the black community, but also the anti-war protesters, because that was a significant movement at the time. But also a key part of the war on drugs policy was it was exported around the world via kind of the US's economic might in the kind of Cold War era. How did you sort of see that on a global scale? Well, that was just a huge disservice we did to the entire world. And you could even see it today that Miss Richardson, that, that runner, got disqualified from the Olympics because the drug czar during Bill Clinton insisted on marijuana being on the list of banned substances just because they wanted to have all these athletes be examples of like people who didn't use drugs and they wanted to stigmatize drug users. You know, and they were arguing at the same time that marijuana is cannabis is a performance enhancer and that it causes a motivational syndrome. I mean, you can't have it both ways. It's so stupid if you look at sort of what they were arguing. But again, just as you say, they the US really bullied and muscled the whole world into this. And I think a lot of that comes down to just the corporations wanting to have their way and not wanting cannabis to compete with the other corporations. And that's a lot of what US government policy was beholden to with some superstition and you know zealotry mixed in as well. It's just absolutely ridiculous. We never needed to criminalize cannabis and we certainly didn't need to force the rest of the world to do it either. It's really awful. Yeah, it is. And very small movements at the kind of UN level, but we, we've seen some recent movements at least, which is positive on that side of things. And just to get an idea, I read a figure about how much money has been spent on this war on drugs. Some, I think I read an article saying something like $2 trillion since the 60s or something. It's crazy, isn't it? It's hard to say. I mean, there's the money that's been spent on law enforcement, there's the money that's been spent like an interdiction and like destroying crops all over the world. There's the money that's been spent on propaganda. There's the money that's been spent on incarcerating like millions of people, mostly people of color in the United States. There's the money that you have to factor in of all these ruined lives and ruined communities that, you know, people, when they come out of prison, it's hard to get a job and it's hard to get housing and it's hard to get education. I mean, how do you even fact put a monetary value on that magnitude of suffering? You know, a lot of these people can't vote. Like if you're a felon, you can't vote. That's another way they oppress communities of color with the war on drugs. They disenfranchise people. So I think it's sort of infinite, the harm, the cost. And I think it's really hard to put a number on it. I mean, it's just so, you know, and all the asset forfeiture they've done, they're like taking people's assets because they suspect them of drug dealing and, you know, all the violence that's been needlessly created. And I think that, for example, like all the opiate overdoses are due to the war on drugs. Like say legal drugs are safe drugs. And if opiates were legal and regulated, nobody would be overdosing on fentanyl in the United States. It's just because it's illegal and people can't get treatment for their addiction or for their chronic pain that they're resorting to street drugs. We just had a like a huge increase 
Part of that was due to the pandemic, but we lost 93,000 people last year to opiate overdoses. I mean, that's absolutely insane. I mean, I think you have to factor that into the cost of the war on drugs. So I think it's like whatever you estimate is going to be too low if you factor in all this other stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's the, you know, the financial, but obviously the, the time and the, the human cost is incalculable, really. And the cartels, all the fighting with the cartels, like there wouldn't be cartels if there weren't a war on drugs. Like we created all that. If drugs were legal, safe, regulated, monitored, there wouldn't be any drug dealers. There wouldn't be any organized crime involved. It would be all produced by the government, taxed, regulated. There were, all of that nonsense would be gone too. I mean, it's sort of infinite. Yeah, no, it really is. And it kind of leads on to my question, which was, you know, you've kind of touched on it so far, but, you know, as a doctor, how do you view this being treated as a criminal issue rather than a public health issue? Well, it's awful, you know, and I, I see the results of it, you know, because I work in a pretty underserved community and I just see people with these like criminal records who are suffering from addiction and then they have like two problems. They have their addiction and they have the criminal record, which makes it that much harder to access care, to get a job, to get education, to get housing and so forth. And it just doesn't help at all, in my opinion, to have law enforcement involved with anything drug related. I think it makes everything worse. They have all the wrong incentives. They want to arrest people. They want to seize assets. You know, unfortunately, there's a, way too many people and more than zero is way too many people. They're just obviously a lot of racist officers and it just escalates the violence. And I just think if drugs were legal and dealt with by scientists, healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, lawyers, social workers, public health officials, we can manage it completely without arresting people, treating people with dignity, helping people that, that need help. And we'd be so much better off. I just, I don't understand how law enforcement got involved in the first place. And it just, it's absolutely like across the board, in my opinion, like the wrong solution is like using a carpenter to fix, you know, your shrubbery. It's like just the wrong expert, the wrong, like, you know, skill set for like the wrong problem. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether you have it in the US. I've seen a couple of examples of it. In the UK, we have we have some fairly senior police who are actually looking at the problem and seeing that, you know, we have limited resources to deal with crime in general. And, and a lot of them are like, we'd rather use these limited resources to tackle violent crime rather than wasting time busting kids or young people who are smoking weed. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of police forces that are now just taking a, a slightly more softer approach on it because it's in the list of priorities, it's not the highest. We're seeing that in the one hand, but in the other hand, people are so wedded to their budgets. We have the number one. Number two, it, we have this, again, this crazy thing called asset forfeiture where you're allowed to seize assets. So that gives an awful incentive. They want to keep, if I'm a policeman, and I suspect you of drug dealing. I'm allowed to just, like seize your assets. Like police is allowed to like seize cars and houses and money. It's this crazy law we have. So they love having cannabis be illegal. And then third of all, it's like much easier work arresting people for cannabis and getting their quotas for arrest than arresting real dangerous criminals. So law enforcement's been like profoundly opposed to legalizing cannabis. Some ethical and enlightened law enforcement officers and particularly ex-law enforcement officers who are no longer involved in like the conflict of interest have certainly come out and said, this is crazy. Why are we arresting people for cannabis? But there's been, in general, law enforcement has been like incredibly opposed to legalizing cannabis. And I think, again, it goes down to the quote, I believe by the writer Upton Sinclair, it's very difficult to get a man to understand something if his earning a living has to do with his not understanding it. I mean, I just think it's as simple as that. Yeah, very well. Perverse incentives and kind of self-serving institutions, I think, obviously not helping the situation. But, you know, things are starting to change. You know, as we sort of close this out, what are your hopes for the future and where do you see the challenges? Well, I have a lot of hope for the future. We're legalizing it state by state. I mean, at some point, the federal government's going to have to legalize it. Like, what are they going to do? We have like all 50 states have it legal and it's still illegal in the federal government. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Three of the last four referendums in Republican states passed for recreational legalization, not just for medical. 94% of Americans currently believe 
in legal access to medical cannabis. For adult use or recreational cannabis, like 69% of Americans are in favor of it, including more than half of Republicans. It's definitely going to happen. The question is how and when. I'm so optimistic. I'm also really optimistic about the science. It's so exciting, these discoveries we're making about the endocannabinoid system, you know, the group of set of receptors, neurotransmitters, and chemicals throughout our brains and bodies by which cannabis works. We're discovering all these new medicines and new components of the cannabis plant. The cannabis plant has like 600 different molecules in it, and we're understanding some of the smaller components, how they work, and how we could utilize them. And we're developing new drugs based on this system to help people with all kinds of medical problems. I think it couldn't possibly be a more exciting time to be involved in this field. So I'm basically like, we've been talking about the sort of dark underbelly because we've been talking about the war on drugs, but it's really just a incredibly hopeful and optimistic time to be involved in this issue. Yeah. Brilliant. That's a great way to round it out. And and great that you kind of mentioned the scientific and the research side of things, because we're just kind of treasure trove to kind of get into and so much to learn. That it's really, really, really exciting. I'm really lucky that I get to speak to so many amazing scientists and doctors like yourself who are kind of at the forefront of it. Well, it's, you know, it's just fun. It's like, it's also a great community. The people who are involved in cannabis, like not everybody, but in general, they tend to be really fun, nice, curious people. And they're just a pleasure to work with. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, Peter, thank you so much. Like we really could have gone on a lot longer, but we got it in at 40 minutes, which is brilliant. So thank you very much for sparing the time today. And I really enjoyed the chat. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed the chat as well. Cool. And I'd love to have you back on at some stage. So let's do that. Happy to. Thanks, Peter. Have a good day. Okay, you too. Take care. Nice chatting with you. Cheers. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. If you're interested, please visit www.canverse.global to get in touch.